Hello everyone, this is Daniel. This is going to be part three of my new Christian series. Today we are going to be talking about a very good topic, salvation. It's going to be titled Salvation, a how-to guide. There's a lot of things that we have, a co we have to cover, so we got to get straight to it. Um, last time we talked about what does it mean to be a disciple, and I hope that you would have chosen to, to be a disciple of Christ, to follow his teachings and to obey it. And so now... Um, it doesn't have to go into a specific order. Salvation can come first, and then a true commitment can, can happen afterwards. But uh, nevertheless, we're going to be looking at what you need to do in order to be saved. First of all, let's ask ourselves, what is salvation? What does it mean to be saved? Well, we need to first ask, ask ourselves, what the, save from what even? Save from what even? God's wrath on sin. This is, a, this is all throughout the Bible, but the reason why why hell exists, why wrath, God's wrath exists, is because of sin and our disobedience to him. Very simple. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 1.10 confirms this, and it says, at the end of a sentence, Paul writes, and to wait for his son from heaven, we Christians are waiting for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. So it's Jesus who rescue, rescues us from the coming wrath. And we're already starting to see what we need in order to be saved. And that's Jesus. He's going to be the focal point of this. You see, we have all done morally wrong things, and that is what is defined as sin. Romans 3, uh, verse 23 says, simply all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And it's exactly because of that that God has wrath. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6 gives us an even bit better picture of this and says, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him, that's Jesus, the iniquity of us all. So because of our sin, because of our iniquity, uh, God has laid that sin on Jesus' account so that he would pay it whenever he died on the cross. So he paid for our sins on the cross. That's, that's a little bit of what we're going to be talking about, but more so we're going to be talking about what you specifically do in order to be saved. And so I think it's very clear that um, people send themselves to hell by their sin. Uh, you don't go for hell for not believing in Jesus. You go to hell for your sin. But I will say that it is a sin not to believe in Jesus. John 8 verse 24 says this. Jesus says to the Pharisees, I told you that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. So because the Pharisees won't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, they will unfortunately die in their sins. Why? Because they don't have anyone to cure them of their sickness called sin. You see, people ask, why would God send people to hell? Why would a loving God send people to hell? Well, here's the thing. Again, God doesn't send anyone to hell. You don't die of a sickness because you didn't go to the doctor who could cure the sickness. You died because of the sickness. That's the same thing with the sin. You don't, you don't go to hell uh, because you didn't believe in Jesus. You, you went to hell because you didn't go to Jesus who could take the sin away from you. You died because of your sin. And, of course, you know, it would be a back and forth argument, but in general, let's let's keep on topic here. Um, that's what we need to be saved from. We need to be saved from God's wrath. We need to be saved from uh, the penalty of that, which is hell. And again, don't be tempted to, to to think that God is unloving for doing such a thing because a loving God must be just. It just so happens that this is the way God is just. And again, someone might say, well, you know, I don't accept that. How could a, still, how could a, I wouldn't do that. How could a loving God do that? And to which I could respond, yeah, how could a loving God send down his son for us, you know, have him get killed on the cross in the most painful way and solve the entire problem for us? So we don't have to worry about hell because we have Jesus to solve that problem for us. The question is, are we going to accept that as the solution for our sin? And that's exactly what we're going to be looking at today. So... Another thing we have to ask ourselves is, why is it that we can be saved? Well, again, like I said, because Jesus, he took the punishment for sin on the cross. And because of that, now it is possible for God to pardon us from our sin. Uh, the two words that would be used to describe this would be justification and sanctification. That will be covered in the next video. So, what is, so now we asked all these different questions. Why do we need salvation? What does it mean to be saved? It means to be saved from, from God's wrath on sin. We need to come to Jesus in order to get that cure for our sin. And the reason we can get saved is because Jesus took the punishment for sin on the cross. 
And so because God took the punishment off of us and put it on Jesus, now we are able to be forgiven and justified, which is what we'll be talking about in the next episode. But first, we need to cover salvation, right? What is salvation at the core? Well, salvation, as we saw um, from the previous episodes, is knowing God. We saw that, uh, we saw from John 8, 24, first of all, right, that we need to believe that Jesus is who he said he is in order to, uh, in order to be saved. We need to believe that Jesus is the Savior. He's the Messiah. And the essence of salvation in that sense is that we enter into a personal relationship with Jesus. John 17, 3 lays it out very well. It's, it's, I think it's a very core verse to telling us what it is about. Jesus says in a prayer to his Father, now this is eternal life, that they know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. That is what eternal life is. That is what salvation, it is about knowing Christ. It's about knowing him personally. It's about entering into a personal relationship with him. We enter salvation when we enter a personal relationship with Jesus. You see, what Jesus and the apostles were about was the ministry of reconciliation. Our sin has separated us from God and we now need to be reconciled to him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18-20 through 20 tells us this. Paul writes, All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as, th as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And that's my message to you. Be reconciled to God. We are reconciled to God and made alive by living in a union with him. A broken relationship that was caused by the fall of man and when sin entered into the world in Genesis 3. All of this is restored by Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Because of his blood, we can be forgiven. Our relationship to God can be restored. Um, and the, the simple conclusion of this is that we need to establish and maintain a relationship uh, in order with, with Christ in order to have salvation. So, again, the essence of salvation is this. It is establishing and maintaining a real, heartfelt, you know, from the heart, uh, genuine relationship with Christ. That is salvation. And we enter into salvation when we enter into that relationship with Jesus. So as we covered, it's on the basis of a relationship with Christ. There's a few things that I that I think, a few aspects of this that we need to have in our lives in order to really, you know, have a relationship with Christ are these four things. We need to receive Christ. We need to believe in Christ. We need to trust in Christ. And we need to obey Christ. Those are the four things that we need to do if, if we want to have a relationship with Christ. You see, the word faith does not just mean believe, but it also means trust. And in the case of the word faithfulness, it also means loyalty. When we believe Christ, that means, we, that, means that we acknowledge that what he says is true. When we trust in Christ, what that means is that we make a decision to say, God, Jesus, you covered everything for me. You already did everything that needs to be done in order for me to be saved. And I'm going to trust in that. I'm not going to try and, and trust in myself. I'm not going to try and trust in my good works. I'm not going to try and be good enough in order to go to heaven. But I'm going to trust in you, Jesus, that you already did everything that needs to be done for me to go to heaven. That is what it means to trust in Christ. And also that, Christ, you're going to help me with this. You're going to do what, you, what, what needs to be done in my life so that I can have that relationship with you. That, that is what it means to trust in Christ. And loyalty very easy. It means that we don't compromise. It means that if we have a choice between sin and the world and Christ, we're saying, I'm staying loyal to Christ. I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to uh, betray him. I'm not going to compromise. I'm going to stay loyal and faithful to him like a wife does to her husband and a husband does to her wife all throughout our lives. So those are the four things that we need to make sure that we have in our, in, uh, in our lives. We need to 
we need to, you know, believe in Christ, we need to trust in Christ, and we need to, you know, obey him, right? Be loyal to him. And the, the beginning of all this is receiving him, saying, Jesus, I receive you, I want you in my life, please respond to me. So, again, the first thing of all that is that we must receive and welcome Christ. John chapter 1, verses 9 through 13 says this. It says, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and, through, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which is his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children, born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. What do we have going on here? Well, very simply, that those who received him, Jesus, those who received him, Jesus gave them the right to become, the chil to become children of God. What does that mean? That means that Jesus, if we receive him, he says, okay, if you do the right things now and you and, and uh if you do the right things in the sense that if you receive me and as a result of that you believe in me, you trust me and you begin to obey me, then you will become a child of God. So you have the, the right to become a child of God when you receive uh, Jesus Christ. As I said before, we must believe in Christ, right? Again, John 8, 24, we read that Jesus said, says that if you don't believe that I am who I am, then you will die in your sins. And so here's the thing. If we don't believe in Christ, what, do, what, what are we saying essentially? We're saying that you, he's a liar. Jesus says something, we say, I don't believe you, right? It's like, oh, so I'm a liar? That's exactly what it means to not believe in God. We basically are accusing him of being a liar. And that's why it's so important to believe in Christ and, and accept his claims of what he uh, says that he is. Uh and like I said, we must trust in Christ alone for our salvation. We have nothing else to hold on to. We must trust in him to guide us, to lead us on the right path, and ultimately that he did everything that needs to be done in order for us to be with him in eternity. And this is a warning for us in trusting in ourselves. In Jeremiah 17, verses 5 through 8, it says this. It says Jeremiah says, this is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be planted like a tree, planted by the water. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its root, roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes, its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. So that is the difference between trusting in yourself and trusting in the Lord. If you trust in yourself, you're going to be put under essentially a curse. Because we were made to trust in God. So that is what we need to do. We need to trust in God. We cannot rely on ourselves. We have to rely on God. We have to come to him, say, God, help me with these problems. Help me to be faithful. Help me to, to do the things that I need to do in order to... In order for you, in order for me to meet your conditions for salvation, that is what God wants from us. Uh, and again, the things that we want to guard against is self righteousness. We want to guard against the fact that oh, we think we're so good. We're not. We all sinned. We all need forgiveness from, and we all need salvation. We need to guard against self effort in the sense that um, I'm going to work for my salvation. And we also need to guard against self trust. Don't trust in yourself. Trust in God to help you out. And again, the basis, uh, the final aspect of the basis of a relationship with Christ is that we must obey Christ. John 15, 14 says something very short but also important. Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I command. People who are out there who just, you know, live however they want, say they're a Christian, not according to Jesus. Jesus says, you are my friends, friends if you do what I command. So that is what we need to do. We need to make sure that we obey Christ and remain loyal to him throughout all of our life. We don't just live however, but we live according to the way that he taught us to live. So that is what it means to have, to, to have a relationship with, with what, those are, that's the basis of having a relationship with Christ. And that relationship is what we need in order to be saved. So the question now comes to this. So 
how do I get saved? What do I need to do? Well, there's something that I think is very practical. It's called the ABCs of salvation. A, admit that you are a sinner. Come to Jesus, cry out to him, confess your need to be forgiven of your sins. 1 John 1, 8 through 9 says this, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and will purify us from all unrighteousness. So again, admit your sins, come to Jesus. He will forgive you. If you come to him in prayer and say, I'm sorry, I am a sinner. I need you to save me. God will listen. Because again, he says that if you confess your sins, he will forgive you. Furthermore, in John 6, verse 37, Jesus says, all, the, all those that the Father gives to me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never uh, cast out or I will not reject or I will never drive away. So if you come to Jesus confessing your sins, he will forgive you and he will not in any way reject you. That's the first thing we need to do. B, believe. Believe what? Believe the gospel. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 5, it tells, it tells us what the gospel is. Paul writes this. He says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. So we need to. We need to believe this, okay? Because it says, otherwise you have believed in vain. What is the gospel? Paul writes, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, which is Peter, and then to the twelve. So the gospel is this. The gospel is a set of three facts, and you must believe them if you want to be saved. That Jesus died, that Jesus was buried, and that Jesus rose again from the dead. That is what we need to believe. That is what it means to believe the gospel. C. Choose Christ to be Lord. Right? God is, now I realize that Christ is already Lord over all, but it's about putting down your rebellious life against him. This means that you, come to, that you come to a place where you make a conscious effort to do the things that God wants you to do and to overcome the things that God deems as sinful. That is what we talked about with what it means to be a disciple, right? You choose to live according to the teachings of God. So if you want to be saved, right, come to God in a prayer. You can pray a sinner's prayer. There are some people who are against the sinner's prayer. In the sense that they say, well, it's not in the Bible, and, and it's like, why would you have it now? Well, this, now here's the thing I have to say on the sinner's prayer. The sinner's prayer gets you, gets you like to the door. It gets you to Jesus. But it doesn't get you necessarily through the door. All the things that we've mentioned before get you through the door. This prayer that you can pray is what will get you to that place where you can um, start to initiate this process of, of forming a relationship with Jesus. And so I will not have the sinner's prayer right now. I will have it in the description for your, uh, I'll have it in the description for you to pray if you uh, need it. All right. So after we admit that we are a sinner, after we believe that, you know, if we believe the gospel and if we are willing to choose Christ to be Lord, we can now enter into a relationship with him. And so the result of, and so what we want to do with the sinner's prayer is that we want to cry out to Jesus from our heart as well, right? We want to do these things, but we also want to cry out from the heart. Um, 2 Corinthians, uh, I mean, Romans chapter 10, verses 12 through 13 says this. It says, For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So just call on Jesus, ask him to help you, ask him to save you. That's what I did, and he did that. The result of all this is this, right? You can't just do this and remain unchanged. If you did this and you remain basically unchanged, two things. Either you were never serious about this or, or you weren't serious about it. There really isn't too much more about this because when you cry out to Jesus, the real the new birth has to happen. There has to be a newness of life that comes out of this. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse seventeen, Paul emphatically declares, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, 
The new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. So you are now, you are now in a place where your old sin is washed away because of what because you put your faith in Christ. But you are now supposed to live a new life, a new lifestyle. You are now at war with Satan and sin. And you are now at a place in your life where if you do this, you now have to battle your sin. And here's what I say about that. You overcome your sin not to be saved, but you overcome your sin because you are saved. And the implication of that is clear. That if you're not overcoming your sin, if you're not making progress on it, it's doubtful whether you're even saved. All right. Now, there's things like sexual sin and habitual sin that is dealt with, but, and I'll have some, and I have a series on it that deals with that. I also will be making a video in it about it in this series. So, but the main point is this there needs to be progress, there needs to be a heartfelt intent on overcoming this sin. So, those are the three things you should expect from from your from your conversion that you need to live in the newness of life you are now at war with satan and sin and you need to be making progress against satan and sin you need to be overcoming your sin not because not you're not doing that to be saved you're doing it because you were saved and if you're not doing it it's doubtful whether you were even saved it's a product of salvation what's the follow-up so after you've done all this what are some other things that you may need to do well be baptized Baptism is not an option, and um, that means that if you have the option of getting baptized, you need to take it, all right? You can't just refuse it. Jesus commanded us to be baptized, and if there is no option, you need to pray and look out for those opportunities and also be proactive in, in, in finding out that opportunity. Matthew 28, verse 19, Jesus says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So what this tells us here is that there is a direct connection between being a disciple and being baptized. Um, in Mark 16, uh, I believe in chapter 5 and uh, verse 15, Jesus says that those who believe and are baptized will be saved. So there is a, a, a connection between salvation and baptism. And the reason why is because I believe baptism is a test of your commitment. If you're not even going to get baptized when God commands you, you're not... You, in all due, all due respect, but you're not being serious about, about your salvation because Jesus says, okay, you want to follow me? You want salvation? Do this thing. Do this thing. Get baptized. And if a person says, oh, that's not really necessary. Well, I'm sorry. You're just not listening to Christ. You're not being serious. You're already, you're already allowing your rebelliousness to come up and you're already straining the relationship, which you just claimed you, you formed. So baptism is integral to, um, to, to salvation because it is a symbol of your commitment towards God. And if you're not interested in it, if you're not going to pursue it, then I can't even, uh, I cannot um, with full confidence say that you will be saved. I just cannot do that on a biblical basis. Um, here's some other things I need to talk about baptism. Uh, what are the requirements for baptism? Uh I can reference a few a few verses here. If you want to read them on your own, you can. Acts eight verses thirty six through thirty eight. It tells it gives us a couple of requirements for baptism. One of them is that we need to believe the gospel. You need to believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and that He did the things that He did. Right. You need to also be committed in living your whole life as a disciple of Christ, and you need to also be fully submerged in your baptism. And also the other reference that I that that these requirements come out of from another reference is Matthew chapter three verses six through nine. So that is what you need in order to in order to be baptized. You need to believe the gospel in order to be qualified for baptism. You need to believe the gospel, be committed to living your entire life for Jesus, and that you're fully submerged during your baptism. I do. I, there there's some controversy over whether it can be poured over or sprinkled. I think it's much safer to do it the biblical way and. With the abundance of water that we have, bathtubs and whatnot, uh, you should be able to find a way to get fully submerged in baptism. A couple more things I need to address. Uh, what about like getting baptized in Jesus' name, getting baptized in uh, the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Both are in the Bible. All right. Just because you know someone is 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 baptized in the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit doesn't mean that they're not truly baptized. Right. There's a controversy over that. Um, 
if you're getting baptized, you see, here's the thing. What is the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit? It's God, right? So, uh, what's and then guess in this specific example, what is the name of the Son, Jesus? So, uh, there, there isn't, uh, there, there shouldn't be a controversy over this. Be re rest assured that if you get baptized in the name of Jesus, if you get baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you're doing nothing wrong. Both are valid, right? It's not words that get you saved. It's the action that, that God is, is, is looking for, that you have a heart commitment towards him and that you express that commitment in the form of getting baptized. That is your proper response towards salva to salvation. Now, let me address rebaptism. baptism uh, right, People say, what if I got baptized as a, as a child, you know, as a, as a baby, that kind of thing. So what if I was not a serious Christian before and I got baptized and now I want to you know, be a serious Christian? What do I do? Well, here's what I have to say. In general, if the above conditions were not met, if all three conditions were not met, I don't, it cannot be considered a, a baptism. So let me ask, can a baby believe the gospel? I don't think so. I don't think a baby can believe the gospel. Sorry about that. Apparently the electronics are acting up, but it's, it should be good now. Um, so again, you know, a baby cannot believe the gospel they cannot fulfill that requirement for baptism and if you got baptized and you were not a serious believer well then you also did not fulfill the condition of you know being baptized with the intention of living out your life for christ now if you got if you were trying to be a sincere believer at the time and you did get baptized with the intent of wanting to live out your life for christ the entire uh, thing and you backslid, you fell away. I personally don't believe that there is a need for rebaptism in that point if you want to come back to Christ. But if the Lord is leading you to do that, make sure you do. Um, so I think that's everything I can uh, address regarding baptism. I think that that would be everything regarding salvation. I hope that it was helpful. I hope someone gets saved through this. But anyway, uh, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video. We'll be talking about justification and sanctification. It's going to be a continuation of what salvation is about but this is going to be this this episode was supposed to be the blueprint of how to get saved what does it mean to get saved and i hope that this is helpful so be blessed in jesus name and i'll talk to you soon